from New Hampshire. It's time for the Science Cafe! Learn about the latest technologic innovations today. And you don't have to pay. Expert panels with advanced degrees are sure to satisfy your curiosity. This week, mention is free. And if you think you'll find a better time than this, then come on down and test your hypothesis. Cause you're gonna learn a lot if you wanna stay. Down at the Science Cafe. Welcome to the Science Cafe. My name is Sandy. I'm one of the volunteers that works on the programming with the rest of the team here. Our panelists tonight are experts at all different areas of sleep and wellness, so that's why they're here um, to impart their wisdom with all of us. What we're going to do is um, do some introductions, and then this whole topic tonight gets driven by all of you. It's an audience-driven participation um, type of event. First, let me thank the Riverwalk Cafe for continuing to host Science Cafe as we go into 2020. Okay, so thank you to our three panelists tonight. I'm gonna go right through um, a high level introduction and then have each of them give a little bit more details. But Dr. Heather Talman Rum, who's here right to my mm -hmm. left, she's known to her patients often as Dr. Heather and she's a medical doctor and licensed family physician dedicated to helping people reach their optimal wellness and improve their quality of life. Christine Brown, who is in the middle, She's the founder of Bella Luna Family Sleep, a parent consulting company based here in Nashua, right here in the North End. Um, Bella Luna's mission is to educate, support, and coach families through their parenting journey and their entire fam so their entire family can be happy and healthy and get a good night's sleep. And she'll tell you some of her background about her twins that got her started in this business. At the end here, we have Dr. Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum. She specializes in pulmonary medicine here in Nashua at Southern New Hampshire Medical Center. And she also is a sleep specialist at the Sleep Center. We'll um, be talking about sleep for everyone, ranging from children all the way up to people that need to go for sleep studies. So we're gonna have each of the panelists give a little bit more introduction about their backgrounds. And my, I'm gonna ask the first question, when they do that introduction, if they can tell us to them, what is sleep and why is it important? Again, my name is Christine Brown. I founded Bella Luna Sleep um, about four years ago. My twins were trying to kill me from sleep deprivation when they were six months old. Anyone in here a parent and been severely sleep deprived? Yes. Well, I tried to find help locally and I couldn't find anyone to help and I would go on the internet and there's so much information available. So we ended up finding a way to get the boys to sleep better, but in turn, um, it found a passion for me about sleep and helping other families. So I got certified to be a sleep consultant about four years ago. Um, and in the past four years, I've helped over 700 families. Um, so I went on to get certified to also um, help with lactation, um, just because I support a lot of lactating moms. And then I also am a child behavior coach. So um, whenever my kids give me a challenge with something, I go on and figure out how to help other people do it. So um, that's essentially how I got started. And I provide um, mostly one-on-one -on -one consulting services. My team and I provide one-on-one -on -one consulting services to families that are experiencing sleep challenges with their kiddos. So we start from newborns, creating healthy sleep habits, all the way up to seven, eight years old, um, working primarily on behavioral issues, so nothing that's medical related. So what sleep means to me, so if you have ever been a sleep deprived parent, you know what sleep means. So for my families, they come to me um, with an overload of information um, and no tribe. So we don't have the same level of support that we used to have from our families um, and our friends. We're all dispersed and there's a ton of information, but there's not a lot of tribal knowledge and people move away from their families. And so that's what we do is help. Um, them to figure out how to create healthy sleep habits. Also, our society is not necessarily geared at this point to have healthy sleep habits. Um, lots of technology, busy schedules, parents working late, um, and so much knowledge. So we really help them to come up with a plan to help their kiddos to be better rested. And so that's really what sleep means to me is meeting both daytime, nighttime sleep because it really impacts the entire family. Um, so when the kids are better rested, they're happier, healthier, and then the parents are also happier and healthier in turn. I'm Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum. And I was uh, trained in internal medicine and pulmonary medicine. And with that comes the condition known as sleep apnea, where people don't breathe right at night. And as a result, they wake up. It disrupts their sleep. And I was seeing a lot of people that were having sleep disruption due to this respiratory problem. 
But once I met them, they were having a lot of other problems because there are other things besides breathing problems that disrupt sleep. And about 30% of the population at any one time suffers also from insomnia. So I became a board certified sleep specialist. And I see people in consultation in the clinic, uh, at which time I assess their sleep and their medical conditions that might be affecting sleep. And I also run the sleep center that's over on the West Campus at Southern New Hampshire Medical Center, where uh, sleep studies are conducted both sleeping at the sleep center uh, in an overnight attended, what we call polysomnogram. And I can talk more about what that means, uh, what a sleep test consists of. But technology changes, and we now have home sleep apnea tests. So you can take home a little suitcase and hook yourself up and bring it back the next day, and we can interpret that. And that is a great way for people to not have to leave their children or uh, a parent or other people they're responsible for and get a fairly good sense of whether or not they have sleep apnea or it's not great for other conditions. So what does sleep mean to me? As was mentioned, it used to be thought that when people fell asleep, their brain just shut off. And then it kind of turned back on in the morning. What we know now is that uh, sleep is a very complicated process that's necessary for health. Otherwise, we wouldn't spend about a third of our life doing it under uh, good circumstances. And sleep, for me, is um, someone who gets a um, night's sleep, typically of eight hours duration. So one thing is that you're getting enough sleep and that that sleep is not disrupted uh, by medical conditions or other conditions. And as a result, you're able to get the right kind of sleep. What we know is that sleep comes in two flavors, dream sleep and non-dream sleep. And that non-dream sleep has four different stages. And for somebody to feel rested, they have to get pretty much some of each. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are defined percentages. People spend about a fifth of the night dreaming, about 20% of the night dreaming, and also need to have a goodly amount of slow wave sleep, uh, which is uh, the most restorative sleep. So sleep uh, has four stages, and the um, stage one is where you're just sort of falling asleep, and stage two is when you're breathing and your heart rate starts to regulate, the body temperature starts to drop, and then you get into more of the restorative phases of sleep. Uh, during non-dream sleep, the uh, mind is relatively inactive, but the body is quite active. And during non-dream sleep, the mind is highly active, but your muscles do not work. Uh, you become paralyzed in all but your breathing muscles. Otherwise, you would jump up during a dream and run away. And that actually is a sleep condition that happens. So my goal is to help people understand sleep and how to get good sleep. And those are the focus of my consultations. My name is Heather Tallman Room, and I am a, as it was stated, I'm a family physician. And I've worked in the field of integrative holistic health all of the years that I've practiced. Um, and I met Christine about two years ago, I think. I was doing a radio show on health called Health Matters out of, based out of Manchester. And I was just reviewing that today, saying, what did we, what did we talk about when I interviewed her on sleep? Um, and the reason that I brought that topic up into my series of radio shows, I did eight that year, is because those corresponded with eight chapters of a book that I've been writing for quite some time. And it was the fourth chapter. And the eight chapters are the underlying causes of what I think are the main underlying causes of all illness today. And the fourth chapter is on deficiency. And I chose to interview on sleep because sleep deficiency amongst all deficiencies, whether it's nutritional deprivation or emotional deprivation, et cetera. Um, sleep is very high ranking in terms of the impact that it has on us when we lack in it. I was very honored to be offered the opportunity to meet with you all here and be on this panel. It um, shifted me back into thinking more about that, the role of sleep. And in so doing, I've learned a lot about the, how sleep impacts our physiology, our biochemistry, 
And so when it comes to science and sleep, I, I'm like a big nerd. I mean, it's all about what is happening inside our brain, inside our nervous system, our endocrine system, our immune system, all of those systems and how they're playing out uh, with sleep or with the lack of sleep and how that impacts our life in terms of what we call in the medical field comorbidities. So what, is, what other illnesses or health consequences do we experience by not getting enough sleep and how much is enough sleep? And I know what, uh, and I'm gonna say Dr. Stephanie if that works, because your last name is harder. <laughs> um, mentioned the different stages of sleep and uh, Christine also, and, and in the introduction, we were talking about how we used to not think that sleep was that relevant or that, you know, it's for sissies, right? And I think we brag in our culture about not getting sleep, right? Oh, I only got four hours last night, you know, I'm, I'm, I only need six or whatever. But the real question is, what are we doing to compensate for those numbers of sleep or those hours that haven't been achieved in sleep? Because... It turns out that there is so much that happens during sleep for our physical states, for our mental states, for our cardiovascular system, for our ability to consolidate memories, our ability to become creative, our ability to solve problems, even our ability to, to face recognize, recognize expressions, and to recover from trauma. All of those things have a sleep dependence. And not just catching sleep periodically, but having those stages that Dr. Stephanie talked about. Each of the stages of sleep provides a different milieu for the body to be restored in some way, to consolidate information, to explore patterns of our past, and really to help us think about future and our purpose. That happens with complete sleep. And we know not just ourselves what happens when we're sleep deprived, and we've certainly seen that with soldiers or doctors as we are. You know, we've seen what happens in sleep deprivation in various societies and cultures and times and lives, but we know that all mammals must sleep. And even those that are out in the water have a half a brain that goes into sleep mode while the other one stays alert so that they can stay afloat. If you deprive mice of sleep for two weeks, they die, 100% die. We need sleep for life. We need sleep for our intellect. We need sleep for our emotional capacity, for our ability to regulate, for our nervous system to be able to find a status of calm, to be able to recover from trauma and emotional experiences. That happens in our sleep. This is a question for all three of you. Given the implications of what you have said with respect to the impact on your many aspects of your health, why isn't more attention being placed on this subject? Myself, I ran into this a few years ago and I had never heard anything about it. As a matter of fact, I thought if I was sleep deprived, I was doing good stuff. All the way back to my corporate days. First of all, I'd say you're absolutely correct. I can tell you that even today, in medical school, oh, nursing school, there is minimal attention paid to educating people on the science of sleep and all the important aspects of sleep that have been brought to the fore. And I think that part of that is cultural. Um, as you alluded to, uh, being able to get by on less sleep, four, five, six hours, is a badge of honor. Um, there are a lot of cultures where they acknowledge that we have a period of sleepiness in the afternoon where we're just not as alert. Uh, it might be after lunch, uh, it's particularly in warmer climates, but a lot of cultures have siesta. Uh, the banks close, the people go home for a long lunch and a nap. I think part of it is on the medical profession because, as was pointed out, uh, in order to be able to survive and thrive in medical training because there's so much information and so little time and it's very, medical education is very expensive, not just for physicians but also for nurses, um, 
that the people that should be telling you to sleep more uh, are in a position of do as I say, not as I do. And to be honest, when it comes to funding research, um, such as the National Institutes of Health and such, um, not getting good sleep just doesn't have the same urgency that cancer and asthma and diabetes and such do. But there's no question that as a society, we are not educated on the ill effects of sleep, and it's killing us. It's interesting that you said back to your corporate days, because before I was a sleep consultant, I used to work for Dell. Um, and so, you know, high pressure, um, you know, more, do more, do more, do more. Um, and I think we all follow into it as a society. We're just, you know, pr pressured to do more. And whether that's professionally or personally, there's so many things that are going on that we want to go and do and experience. And um, for both adults and children, sometimes we will put our, um, you know, we'll put our need for sleep behind the things that we want to do. Um, and I think, to your point, it is definitely, we need a cultural revolution, and it's starting. And um, from a corporate standpoint, even Steve Jobs and um, Jeff Bezos and Ariane, Ariane Huffington, who all own amazing companies, all say that their superpower truly is the fact that they, you know, focus on sleep and prioritize it. Um, so I think it's, you know, something where, you know, it's going to happen, and it really does, you know, tie to everything in our lives from a holistic, you know, standpoint. Talking about it, I think all of us, that's a passion of us to, you know, increase knowledge and, you know, help people to get better rest. So starts with everybody who's passionate about it. Yes, and I agree. I triple that, that it is a cultural phenomenon, the way we think about sleep in this country. And uh, we're the only country, North America is the only continent, I guess, uh, that um, one prides itself in lack of sleep and um, doesn't uh, recognize the value of the nap. And so, as Dr. Stephanie was saying, that there's a nap, there's a low point in the afternoon, and that's at a point when um, your circadian rhythm is at one of its low points. Your body wants that rest. So even a 90-minute nap at that time can be as beneficial in many ways as getting a full night of sleep. That being said, a full night of sleep is is so much more significant than a half a night of sleep because you're not getting all the phases within a half a night of sleep. Um, so culturally, it's interesting. It's not like you kind of said indirectly. It's not as sexy um, in terms of medicine and pharmaceuticals and things like that because we know that most of the pharmaceutical medications aren't that effective and have a lot of side effects and maybe disrupt it down the road further, maybe short-term helpful but not long-term. So there isn't really the cash drive for understanding sleep. But now that we know much more of the science of sleep, even the World Health Organization has declared that sleep is a carcinogen, lack of sleep, rather. So sleep deprivation, um, from an immune standpoint, sets us up for a greater likelihood of cancers. The question is, since you do have chemicals that can work in the brain related to sleep, are there any nutrients, vitamins, things like that, even natural, that can be used either to deprivation of the lead to lack of sleep or having more may help with sleep. Is there anything that can be done naturally, more food-wise? I think melatonin, I think I've heard in the past, could be linked to uh, sleep. You know, it works in either way, you know, helping or depriving. There's some promise in certain circumstances, say for melatonin. Uh, melatonin, as maybe many of you know, is a, is a, what, tells your body that it's dark, okay? It's the, it's the hormone that we produce in the pineal gland deep in the brain that says it's dark, it's time to go to sleep. And if, as we age, we don't make as much, um, and so we sometimes don't get that memo as we're exposed, and Christine can talk probably extensively to this, in our environments to more light, in particular blue light, then that blocks that ability for melatonin to speak to you that it's time to go to sleep, that it's dark. So, um, and Dr. Stephanie, who just traveled <laughs> from, she's, she's in jet lag right now, or, or at least recovering, trying to recover from having been seven hour difference time zone. Um, that's another time when melatonin can come really into play. So whether it's a, a, a deficit of melatonin where you can tell your mind it's time, you know, help your, help, you can take an oral version 
of the very thing that your body produces to help your body know that it's dark and it's time. But it's not like a lot of times we think more is better. You know, if I just keep taking more melatonin, more and more and more, you know, maybe I just need to bump it up. It's not that. I mean, just one milligram of melatonin should be enough to tell your body it's dark and if it works, it works. There are some others, valerian root um, has some promise in just terms of calming the brain. So a lot of different things that are helpful are more cognitive than um, herbal and that kind of thing. But I'm sure we have some homeopaths in the audience, so we might have other people within the audience that could share some other tried and true therapies that are oral. Um, I just wanted to comment on one thing that you mentioned nutritionally, or are we short on certain vitamins? That's certainly a possibility. But also, um, when it comes to food, a lot of people have food sensitivities. There's an irritation or an agitation with by eating certain things, and that can create an unrest. So that the body's working through kind of the trauma of being exposed to something that it's not in agreement with, and that can be something that can cause a sleep irritation as well. Let's start with pharmaceuticals. There is nothing more powerful for inducing or uh, preventing sleep than light. So as has been mentioned, if you are exposing yourself to light right up until the time that you, are we burning down, are we okay? Um, right up until the time that you are trying to fall asleep, it will be hard for you to fall asleep unless you're incredibly sleep deprived or have something wrong with the quality of your sleep. Sleeping pills, Ambien included, are really intended for short-term use in a certain circumstances, like you're doing time travel for across time zones, that there is a life cycle event that is highly disruptive, um, a death, a birth. Um, they are really not intended for long-term use. There are a number of reasons for that, and I would point out that from my perspective, one of the most important reasons is they all interfere with the balance of those sleep stages that I spoke about. So for example, anything in the benzodiazepine category, which includes things like Ativan, lorazepam, Ambien, will interfere with slow wave sleep. And I can look at a sleep study at the brainwave patterns without looking at a patient's medication list. And I can often tell you whether they're on one of those medications because they have a reduction in that nice restorative slow wave sleep. And they also have some very unusual brainwave patterns. Um, so it is really meant for short term. So that's the pharmaceutical piece. As for the nutritional piece, there are, I would say, two different categories of things I'd say about you know, you are what you eat. The first thing is that we are very susceptible to the stimulants in our diet. And I have to say that I'm a coffee drinker. So this is a do as I say, not as I do. But um, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol are stimulants. You say, alcohol? That helps me fall asleep. But what happens is that after you metabolize alcohol, it turns into a stimulant. So I, I, I think most of you would recognize that on a night when you drink alcohol, you have a lot of awakenings, and that's why. So if your sleep isn't good, you have to be very careful about those kind of stimulants. And there are so many things now that contain um, you know, caffeine um, and not just drinks. And it's chocolate, and it's tea, and it's coffee. and so So you have to be really cognizant of that. If you have a lot of sleep disruption, you're more likely to have reflux, and reflux in and of itself can wake you. So if you eat spicy, late, heavy meals, that will often interfere with sleep. So nutrition plays into it in that regard as well. I hope your question has been answered. I really love a science panel made up of all women. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, thank you. You know, I have so many questions, but one of them that occurs to me is, um, how important is a nap? I um, love to nap, and I get about five minutes, and then I'm jolted awake. So napping, I know, is different than a full night's sleep. How important is napping? 
Napping is extremely important, and as I mentioned before, in many cultures, it is a defined part of sleep. Um, it must, however, be well-timed and of limited duration. So from a scientific perspective, what you don't want to do is get all the way into dream sleep. And dream sleep happens at about 90 minutes. So the best nap is 30 minutes. 60 is okay. When you get towards the 90, what happens is it, you can get some good mileage out of it, but it will reset your body clocks. So you may end up with some insomnia or a change in your rhythm. The timing is also very important. Um, it is best done within eight hours of awakening, which often is right around lunchtime, but you shouldn't lay down on full stomach. So, but, a, but there's no question that the way to catch up on makeup um, for sleep deficit, um, naps are very important in that regard and much better than sleeping in because we can talk more about circadian rhythm and what that does to your schedule. With children, for you know, I talked about the importance of uh, those different stages that bring on uh, concentrating or enhancing the information or skills and things like that. We know that if we sleep, we get um, better at a task, say. If you're doing a task and then you go to sleep, when you wake up, you're better at that task typically, but that doesn't happen if if, if the eight hours between the doing a task and doing it again is not sleeping, you don't improve. But if eight hours happens when you learn the task and start doing it again and you've had eight hours of sleep, the task actually improves. So you learn physical skills and techniques. And if, if children don't nap, they don't retain learned language, for instance. So a child can't go that eight hours in it, or the full day without a nap and be expected to retain the knowledge of that language that they're picking up in the daytime. Naps for children are incredibly important. Um, you know, five and under, really most children nap until in between three and five. Younger children, um, babies especially, take anywhere in between, you know, usually anywhere in between four or five for newborns all the way up to, um, you know, usually two naps a day, three naps a day. Um, and they're incredibly important because they, number one, it affects their mood. Um, and if they don't get enough sleep during the day, they'll sleep more poorly at night. Um, and oftentimes will need a really early bedtime um, if they don't sleep well during the day, which then in turn can start to shift their circadian rhythm, which is their internal wake in the sleep cycle, um, which we don't want to do too much of because um, nobody likes to get up at 5 a.m. with their kiddos. Um, so yeah, naps are really, really important and getting not just you know short cat naps, um, those are okay for some of the naps, but really morning and afternoon naps both have um, restorative properties. So the morning nap is mentally restorative, the afternoon nap is physically restorative, and so those each need to be an hour. Um, babies need to put their sleep cycles together in order for the nap to be restorative. So they're incredibly important for children. Down here in the front. I was wondering if you could comment on the opposite end of the spectrum, too much sleep. So there are studies that show that sleeping more than nine hours, um, and actually it's, it's on a scale, actually is associated with increased mortality. It's unclear uh, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, whether you're sleeping more because you have conditions or illnesses or undiagnosed sleep problems, but it is not safe. And it's usually indicative of the fact that there is something impaired about sleep quality, whether it's the sleep apnea or there are other conditions such as something called nocturnal myoclonus, which your legs kick uncontrollably at night and it keeps waking you up, so you never really get into the deepest stages of sleep, or you may have other physical conditions um, that are causing extreme fatigue. Is there truth behind catching up on sleep? And can you talk about that if it's true? You really can't make up sleep exactly. I think that if you're trying to get to catch up and you've been deprived by an two and a half hours, you at least better sleep an hour extra to catch up for that two and a half that you missed. But you can't, you can't make up. You can't ultimately make up sleep. 
you can't make up for sleep. So the worst thing you could do is sleep in. Because your body's ability to take advantage of sleep in, in terms of all the things that have been discussed about the body and how it works and the restorative patterns um, are dependent on the body clock, which actually is a defined group of cells in your brain. It, it has to be synchronized. You may be aware that body temperature and hormones in the body um, and your, uh, when you're hungry and when you have to go to the bathroom, those things are all tied into your body clocks and they become um, unsynchronized. Uh, when you travel across time zones, I could speak directly to that as mentioned. Um, but um, the most important aspect of keeping that circadian rhythm, circa meaning about and dia about day, so everybody has a about a 24 hour rhythm, the most important thing is getting up at the same time every day, not varying that more than an hour. So the way most people try to catch up on sleep is by sleeping an extra two, three, four hours in the morning, and what you just did is travel across four time zones. So the things that you can do are to go to bed earlier, and there's a lot of you know, preparation that comes with actually being able to achieve sleep earlier. If you know you're gonna be up late or your schedule's gonna be disrupted, it would be going to bed earlier for a couple of days before and a couple of days after, or taking advantage of naps, as has been said. Could you um, highlight what would be a preferred um, sleep schedule as far as when you'd be heading to bed and when you'd be getting up? And in particular, I'm curious how it differs. I know particularly there's been um, some, some discussion over the years about teenagers and how adolescents are distinctly different than children of just even a couple years before or later. Um, but as a mother who has both teens and um, collegians, I'm curious um, about their preferred sleep cycle. And I'm certainly aware that um, as a society, we do many things that, that counteract that. But if you might touch on those, I'd appreciate the answer. So teenagers need, you know, similar to us, usually nine to 10 hours of sleep. And so what we want to do is figure out what time they have to be up in the morning um, and kind of go backwards with when they actually should be settling into sleep. Um, the biggest thing with teenagers, though, is watching, and, and college students as well, is watching technology. So we've talked a lot about, you know, how light impacts the body. Um, so blue light and white light mimic the sun. Um, and so they tell the body that it's time to be awake. And so if we're exposed to that, it will actually make it harder for children um, and adults to fall asleep. So we should all put our phones on night shift or put them away at least an hour before bed. But especially for children, I usually recommend having a docking station where everybody puts their phones uh, at least an hour before bedtime. Um, and that way the body has a chance to produce the melatonin so that they're able to, um, you know, settle into sleep. So, and for you know, they want to have consistent, fairly consistent schedules, and teenagers and college students usually do tend to sleep in, which isn't the best, you know, the best, but um, also their circadian rhythms are set a little bit later than um, adults. As they get a little bit older, they start to get, um, they need more sleep um, in the morning and less in the early evening, and so bedtime usually tends to par start pushing back, but that goes against the way our society is geared, right, because all um, high school students usually start, you know, school sometime in the seven. And that is against their, their starting school when they really technically should be waking up. Um, so usually like a 10 to 7 or 8 would be their preferred and align with their natural body rhythms. Yet we don't do that. And we, you know, have everything start. And that's also another kind of cultural thing that is trying to shift. There's a lot of talk about starting high school later. So we're aligning with um, children's circadian rhythms. We really get a lot of that... Um dreaming state, that REM state, rapid eye movement state in that last, especially in the morning. And that's a time when creativity happens. And that's a time when we problem solve. So a lot of phenomenal things in terms of breakthroughs in science and medicine and art have happened after deep REM sleep. Because that's when the, your mind is able to really synthesize and, and put patterns together and integrate the things that's been taking in over the course of the day or weeks or whatever. So if you deny that last stage, which is what we're doing with our teenagers, because as you said, Christine, their rhythm is slightly later than ours. So 
something that's, you know, their autonomy. They're kind of breaking free of the parents, like they get to stay up later, you know, that's their time. Um, they aren't actually tired, even if you try to get them to go to sleep earlier, usually, because their peak of needing to go to sleep is comes a little later than the their adult parents. And so they want to go to sleep a little later, and then they would sleep in naturally to get that same amount of time of sleep they would sleep in in the morning somewhat. And that's when that phase hits, that REM sleep, where they're most creative, where their brain is getting its creative juices, really, literally, and where it's synthesizing or problem solving so that they can wake up more prepared for making good decisions in the day or remembering the things that they're learning in college or high school. And that we can't emphasize enough, and we have said it a few times, but we'll keep saying it is... I mean, you ever get up in the night and look how many blue lights are on in your house? At every corner, there's a blue light beeping at you, whether it's the toaster oven or the blow dryer. I don't know. Everything seems to have a light on it, right? So you can find it in the night. I don't know why. But it's just a bombardment of, uh, of disruption of our sleep. So the darker, and we're getting into sleep hygiene here, <laughs> the darker you can sleep in a room, the more apt you are to get those different cycles in your sleep, the m longer you have a break from being exposed to those th electronics before going to bed, the better chances you're going to have restful, non-disruptive, non-fragmented sleep. I'd like to build on my colleagues' answers. Um, they've uh, focused a lot on adolescent sleep, and I agree with everything they've said. You asked, what is the ideal time for sleep? That would seem to be an easy question, but what recent science has told us is that from a genetic perspective, there are night owls and morning larks. And the uh, dilemma is that, you know, school is when it is and college is when it is and, you know, the late night show is when it is, although we can, you know, DVD it now, um, DVR. Um, in any event, um, it is not the same for everybody. And we spend much of our lives trying to compensate for having to function in a scheduling environment that does not match our own. And it changes over time. One of the problems that older adults have is that they have the opposite of what adolescents have, which their sleep schedule or phase tends to what we say advance. So instead of going to bed and being tired at 10, it's 9, and then it's 8, and then it's 7. And the waking time, instead of being 7 a.m., is now 6 a.m., 5 a.m., 4 a.m. And that's a big challenge as we get older. Um, what I would say is that the most important thing is consistency. And the cultural problem that we face is that because for many of us, the schedule that we adapt to during the week is not what our own natural rhythm is, we tend to change it on weekends. And that's basically like creating jet lag in your own body every weekend, and then for every hour you change your schedule, it takes a day to put it back together. But if you sleep in for two, three hours, it can take two or three days for your body to resynchronize so that you can feel your best and so that you can get the correct amount and the correct sequencing of that very restorative deep sleep and REM sleep. You've talked about bad practices um, what are the best practices? If you had to say, here's a recipe for getting a good night's sleep, what would you say? Uh, some of the things that have already been said is routine, is being consistent, um, is not having uh, anything caffeinated late in the day, b afternoon, um, is, uh, yeah, let's start with those two. I think sleep environment is really important. You want to sleep cool, um, dark with white noise. So temperature ideally for sleeping is usually in between 68 to 72 degrees. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, dark, so you want to sleep in a perfectly pitch black environment. If you're looking for a way to do that, you can do it with curtains. There's a product I love called the Blackout Easy, which actually blocks over all light. 
Um, and then white noise. So Marpak makes beautiful products. You can use a fan or an air conditioner, um, and that will help, especially if you're a light sleeper, not to wake up with every ping in the house. And also from a darkness standpoint, you want to scan your environment because like Dr. Heather was saying, there's light on everything now. A little roll of black electrical tape can go a long way um, just you know, to cover up those little blue lights. And if you do need a night light or you need one in the bathroom for the middle of the night or you need one in the hall, you want to look for sunset colors. So reds, oranges, and yellows. Those don't affect melatonin the same way that blue light and white light do. You have to have a bedtime routine. And the bedtime routine has to make your bedroom and your bed a place for sleeping. In today's environment, most people have their bed as command central. <laughs> you have devices and a refrigerator and um, uh, controllers and, you know, for the fan and the light and the, never mind the little lights. And you don't unplug. You know, people are on the phone, on their iPad, uh, watching the TV, and then they shut things off and say, I'm ready for sleep. <laughs> it, it really doesn't work that way. You have to really have a routine. Um, and the only other thing that I would say that hasn't been mentioned is the role of exercise. Um, it's very important um, that you get physical activity every day. And the timing of that physical activity can be quite helpful to the sleep process. As has been mentioned by several, um, temperature is a key factor in your ability to fall asleep. You don't want to be overheated. And because of scheduling, what people tend to do is they tend to exercise either around dinner time or after dinner time. And it takes the body about six hours to cool down from exercise. Um, also, people tend to take a really hot shower immediately before sleep. And while that might have a role in relaxing muscles if you have arthritis, it also heats the body. And so what they say is exercise six hours before the desired sleep time or a hot bath or shower two hours before you want to go to bed can help with the cooling process. And the reverse is true that otherwise it can interfere. And we've all alluded to what a bedtime routine, having a bedtime routine looks like, but maybe it helps to talk a little bit about what that could look like. So you usually want to turn off devices at least an hour before, and you want that routine to be consistent. You want that to be sending your body the message that sleep is coming because it helps that, you know, to prepare. So a simple routine could be, you know, washing your face, brushing your teeth, and you know, putting hand lotion on and reading a book. Um, that could be a good you know, routine. Could also take a shower, like Dr. Stephanie said, or take a nice warm bath, um, you know, reading book. You just want to make sure that the things that you do are calming um, and that they are you know, heading in the direction of your, of your bedroom. I usually encourage families to turn their Wi-Fi off at night, which is a, just a switch, and in particular for children's brains. Also, um, just if you can remove electronics from the bedroom, don't have that a place for electronics. So if you can have that separate from your bedroom, even a battery operated alarm versus one that's plugged in, not having a lot of things that are plugged into the wall. So unplugging is really key. Um, this has been a great program. Could you talk a little bit about sleep paralysis? So you know what paralysis is? Sleep paralysis occurs when there's a disconnect in REM sleep. So as previously mentioned, in REM sleep, the mind is very, very active, but the body is not. And the way that occurs is there's a, a switch in the brain. And when, dream, when you go into dream sleep, it deactivates the muscles so you don't act out your dreams. In certain conditions, including extreme sleep deprivation, and narcolepsy, which is another kind of sleep disorder, what happens is that the brain wakes up before the switch is turned back on. So what happens is you find yourself awake and fully aware of your environment, but unable to move. It typically lasts just seconds 
it feels like ours because it's an extraordinarily frightening feeling. You can still breathe because during dream sleep, your breathing muscles are not paralyzed. Anybody who has sleep deprivation for whatever reason has probably experienced this on rare occasions. But if this is something that's happening to you or someone you know on a regular basis, that should trigger a consultation with a sleep expert. All right, we're gonna to go to the far corner again for the next question. I have a question about things that happen while you sleep. So if you take a given individual, a given individual can have dreams, they can wake up and have a great dream, and they can have nightmares. So I'm talking, you know, I don't want to compare different groups that have like PTSD or things like that. So a given individual, what can happen? What would be the differences, let's say, physiologically or biochemically can, that can drive a dream phenomenon versus a nightmare phenomenon? Because they are definitely two different aspects of things. I'm not sure that I can say what's the difference between like a pleasant dream versus a bad dream. Um, but what they have found in sleep research is that the emotions you experience during the day get to play themselves out in your sleep. So if you are experiencing a particular emotion, then it may manifest itself to resolve, partially resolve itself to make that emotion less painful or difficult the following day. It will manifest in some bizarre, freakish way, maybe, if it becomes more nightmare-like. And I, this is where I'm stepping a little bit more into hypothesis rather than actually knowing this truth, <laughs> um, is that you are a unique experience. And everything you've ever observed or been part of in your lifetime is part of your unique story experience. Sorry, I didn't mean to neglect this whole side over here. <laughs> I'm just going to the person asking the question. Um, so what happens when you're in that REM state, that rapid eye movement, very active brain, paralyzed body state, is that your mind, in essence, is going on search for everything relevant and pertinent to that emotion that you are going to process that particular night. So one of the things they've found with PTSD, kind of serendipitously, is that in post-traumatic stress, when someone is reliving a nightmare and reliving a nightmare, they aren't getting that emotional resolve in the night. And that has to do with a chemical being elevated that doesn't go down to the state it's supposed to. You're, when you're in your REM sleep, you're supposed to be in a safe place, not high adrenaline state. You're supposed to be safe. All right, and protected. And what's happening is they have too much of that kind of adrenaline type chemical happening, and it's not allowing them to get in that state where they can recover from the emotion. And it has been discovered that a particular medication that's for blood pressure, which brings that adrenaline down, can allow someone, even with PTSD, to process that emotion in the night and become less inclined to have those post traumatic recurring nightmares. Just building on that slightly, I'd say the following. A lot of people say, oh, I don't dream. Why is that when we know that 20% of sleep is dreaming? And that's because people don't remember. So a lot of times, whether or not a dream is perceived as unpleasant or even remembered has to do what happens when you wake up either during or at the end of a dream. If you wake up at the end of a dream and fall back to sleep within 10 minutes, there's something called retrograde amnesia, and you won't remember. So if you ever have this incredible dream where you get this brilliant idea for a book or an invention or an app, write it down. It's the one time when I would say, flip the lights on and write it down, because you might not remember in the morning. So if you're not able to fall back, if you're remembering your dreams, then there may be a problem with your ability to fall back to sleep. And that, in and of itself, could say something about your sleep quality or you know, whether or not you have a sleep condition. So that's one thing. The second thing has to do with the physiology of how you feel uh, physically when you wake up. So to the point about adrenaline, if you are prone to palpitations or chest pain or you have angina or something like that, angina, then you wake up with these very uncomfortable feelings, then it will be perceived as much more frightening. And likewise, from a psychological standpoint, as has been uh, discussed, those are the things that will inform whether or not you perceive that to be a problem or not, a problem dream or not. 
So I know a guy who snores very loudly at night. And I'm not going to name names or anything, but he keeps my wife up pretty much every night. And I know it's interrupting her sleep. And there's a million little gadgets that you can find on Amazon. Breathe right strips and chin straps and tubes you plug up your nose to open up your... Is there anything that works to alleviate snoring? What I would say is that if that person, who shall go unnamed... Um, were to be able to ensure that the snoring is not a sign of sleep apnea, okay. then feel free to try anything that might work for you because different things work for different people. What I worry about is that people find a way to reduce their snoring by repositioning themselves or you know, the various devices you talked about. And some of what's happening is that they're masking their sleep apnea, which is dangerous. And the other thing they're doing is disrupting their sleep because sometimes what it's doing is every time you get to the snoring stage, it's waking you up. That was, that's what some of the devices do is give you like a you know, punch in the arm. And so if you're not in deep sleep, you're less likely to snore. So um, unsafe, in my opinion, in the absence of a formal evaluation. This might be similar to sleepwalking, but um, talking in your sleep. I know my children always did it, and it was kind of funny to hear them talk, but I could never understand what they were saying. So um, it's probably just not being able to go into the next phase of sleeping. Um, but do you have any comments on that? I do it, but I don't know very much about it. <laughs> it's, it's actually the same family of phenomena as sleepwalking. Okay, I heard uh, from internet doctor saying seniors uh, need to sleep at 9 o'clock through 12 or 1 o'clock. That is important. Do you, do you have that idea? There is a time, uh, like a window? In, yeah, time window. It's typical for seniors to uh, own rhythm to be keyed into that being the best time to go to sleep is to go to sleep at eight or nine o'clock, so earlier than you might have done earlier in your life. Um, so it's it's not so much anything particular about that time or the environment, just what your own body is expecting to happen, and it's your own rhythm. And it's as I said before, very common for seniors to have to go to bed earlier and then get up earlier. You can modify that um, by using the techniques, some of the techniques we've talked about. And the National Sleep Foundation has a great website that has a lot of um, you know, questions and answers and a lot of resources. Um, but it is very common for that to be an important time for older persons to be asleep. I actually have a follow-up question to that. So I've heard that. Um, older adults sometimes do split nights, so get sleep in the beginning of the night, then have like some time, and then they sleep the rest. Is that the same restorative value if you have a longer period in the middle of the night when you're awake? Uh, it's best to get your sleep in one solid uh, stretch um, and to not be up for more than a half an hour. Because if you're up for an extended period of time, it starts resetting the cycle. And the way that your cycle works over the course of the night is, as has been mentioned, your first dream comes at, at about 90 minutes, but th it's very short. And then as the night progresses, it gets longer and longer. And if you have that uh, disruption in the night, um, it disrupts that restorative pattern. Um, it may be something that people wake up in the middle of the night and have that psychophysiologic insomnia where they're just saying, oh, I might as well give up because no way I'll be able to get back to sleep till 2 a.m. But that is not the preferred sleep pattern. I find that very often when I start to fall asleep, like I'm just about to go to sleep, I get like a jolt, mm -hmm. like electricity running through my body. What is that? It is a very common, non-dangerous phenomenon that happens to a lot of people. Um, there are things called hypnic jerks, where it's almost like you feel like you're falling and you, you know, flail uh, an arm or a leg. Um, some people get uh, what's called like a head bang, where they get this huge, loud popping noise. And it's really an unexplained phenomenon, but it's not 
a sign of anything dangerous. Okay, one last question over here. Hi, so my husband and I work together and we will have the same experience during the day. We'll go to bed. He will start talking about this experience in his sleep. And I'm like, oh great, here we go. And I won't remember anything about my dream the next morning, but I'll know that he has spoken about it and he'll have a completely different point of view on what happened the next day. He won't remember having talked about it in his sleep, but he'll have a totally different aspect of what actually happened. So it's, how do I make him understand what actually happened? <laughs> it's really cool, it's so cool. I'll be like, but this is what you said. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I wanna get in the middle of this one. Um, I have, I am aware of and have had people come in the office with audio and video recordings of their spouse, significant other to prove what they're seeing at night. Um, it sounds like the best solution might be earplugs. Yeah. <laughs> All right, please join me in thanking our wonderful yeah. panel. Bravo. And thank you all for coming out uh, for, for this session on a cold winter night. Next month, uh, February 12th, will be waste management and recycling. So away from the human body and into the things that we do. <laughs> all right. That's what we've been talking about all night. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for coming. We'll see you next month.